Hello, good afternoon. So, uh, Ashu, shall I start now? Yes, okay, here I go. Uh, hello, our viewers here um, who are watching us on Facebook and YouTube. Uh, today, we have our guest speaker, Dr. Shushmita Baso Mujamdar. And uh, before I introduce uh, her, uh, the, the chair for this lecture will be uh, Dr. Professor Seema Bhawa. Um, we, uh, th this lecture is basically a series of lectures uh, organized by the Department of History, University of Delhi. Our speaker, Dr. Sushmita Basu Mujumdar, is currently uh, a professor in the Department of Ancient Indian History and Culture, uh, University of Calcutta. And she specializes in early Indian epigraphy and numismatics. Um, her research interests also include uh, the history of medicine and surgery, and the history of early Indian religions, especially in relation to Archivika and Shaiva traditions. Her publications include uh, From Hindu Kush to Salt Range, Mauryan, Indo-Greek, and Indo-Scythian coin hoards, uh, co-authored with Osman uh, Bioparachi. Money and Money Matters in Pre-Modern South Asia. This book is co-authored with S.K. Bose. And in 2016, uh, uh, Professor Sushmita Basu published Barbara, Barabar and Nagarjuni Hills, a biography of Tivin Sides uh, from Patna. In the same year, she published from Calcutta, The Mauryas in Karnataka. And she has also published Select Early Hist Historic Inscriptions, Epigraphic Perspectives on the Ancient Past of Chhattisgarh, co-authored with Shivkan Bajpai. She has been awarded numerous international research fellowships, including Lovick Memorial and Nile Curtman Fellowships uh, in London and Royal Numismatic Society Fellowship. She has worked in museums across the world, including British Museum, Bibliothek National, uh, Copenhagen Museum, Sri Lanka National Museum, Bangladesh Museum, among others. Today, Professor Majumdar will share her research through an illustrated talk titled, Looking at the Empire from a Regional Perspective, the Mauryas Revisited. Uh, okay, ma'am, please go ahead. Thank you so much for those kind words, you know, which most of it I don't deserve. Uh, thank you so much uh, for inviting me for this lecture. A very good afternoon to all my colleagues in the uh, University of Delhi in the Department of History and my dear students and those who are listening today. Uh, uh, it's really indeed a pleasure for me to uh, talk on the Mauryas because this is a subject which is very close to my heart. And if I may be allowed to share my screen, um, just give me a moment so that I can just quickly share it. I hope uh, all of you can see my uh, slides. Is it visible? Yes. Yeah, yes. thank you so much. Um, just give me a moment. Yeah. Uh, so I'll be speaking today on looking at the empire from a regional perspective, the Mauryas revisited. So of course, this is a topic which has been talked about by so many scholars in the past that it is very difficult to add even an iota. But still, you know, Ashokan inscriptions never fail to surprise you with new facts, with new angles. And especially whenever I visit the sites, I find it so uh, interesting. And over the years, we have also developed a technique called work pattern analysis, which has given us new insights. So I'll be sharing some of them with you. And also as uh, my friend, Professor Parul Pandyadhar just mentioned, that she just asked whether I'll be talking about the Mahasthan inscription. So yes, I will be talking about the Mahasthan inscription, which will be a major part of my talk today. And this talk will be in a hybrid mode. Hybrid not in the sense of online and offline, as we use nowadays, but in the sense of that I'll be shifting once from the primary sources to an interpretative mode, and again, I'll be shifting back and forth with the primary sources, especially uh, the inscriptions, the sites on one hand, and uh, the interpretative mode on the other hand. So please uh, feel, uh, 
it, you know, the, especially the sites. So whenever talking about the Ashokan inscriptions, uh, the first thing which comes to our mind is the vastness of the empire. As we all know that it is the first empire which had the whole subcontinent, leaving aside the far south, almost the whole of the subcontinent under uh, its uh, realm. So, which is very interesting, you know. And uh, uh, what comes to our mind whenever we talk about an empire is a centralized kind of a, an empire. So, by the end of this talk, you will uh, probably you will get the flavor that it was not as centralized as we really think it to be. But to begin with, I will just talk about the major rock edicts, which were not the first ones to be issued by Ashok, but this gives us an idea about the empire. So you can just see on your screen, a few sites like two here are here, uh, which are in Pakistan, Shabazgari and Manchera, all of you know, and two here, Girnar and uh, Sopara, then two in the south, the southern territory, one is Sanati and the other is Eragudi, and two in the uh, like you can say, southeast. This is in Urissa, Dhali, and Jabal. And one here in Kalsi. So the pattern gives you a clue that something is missing in the Kalsi pattern, you know, because every other pattern is a set of two. And you will be surprised to know that whenever you even look at the minor rocketics of Ashoka, you find that these edicts are also in twins. So the whole project of engraving his edicts, which Ashoka had undertaken, were mostly in twins. So this is something which we have to keep in mind. So what about the Kalsi uh, edict? The twin for the Kalsi edict is not available right now. So we have either lost the edict or it is yet to be discovered. So I'll come to this later, a little later. But when I talk about the regions within the empire, mainly we have to keep in mind that initially it was the Magadhan territory which was in mind. You know, when Ashoka himself talks about his empire, he was well aware that it was a huge empire. So he himself says that it is Mahalakehi Vijitam. So it is a Mahaloka, huge territory. And of this, he himself uses the term Raja Magadhi. So Magadha stands out as the main metropolitan. So this is one kind of a uh, region. You know. The other than this, the rest of the regions are the Northwestern with Taxila probably as the center. And then you have the other region, which is Jenny and the, the administrative water is at Ujjaini, the region around Ujjaini. Of course, the southeastern will be Kalinga, which we all know. And there is a distinct southern territory, which has the headquarter at Suvarnagiri. But there are also sub-region kind of uh, places, like I'll be talking about Isila today. Uh, I'll come to that a little later. But what I was just talking a few minutes back, that is uh, how Ashoka himself mentions that uh, he is Raja Magadhe. So he is the king of Magad. So this is something very interesting, you know. Though he talks about a Mahalakre, that, that's a huge territory, he himself talks about Jambu Dweepa. But at the same time, at, in one of the edicts, he also calls himself Maraja Magadhe, which is important. We all know about Devanang here, which is the epithet of... Uh, Ashoka, but his name definitely was Priyadarshi, as even in the Greek and the Aramaic edicts, we find the term Priyadarshi and Priyadarsh. So this is something very interesting that how we have lost the name Priyadarshi from our memory, you know, as we had lost Ashoka totally from our memory. And it was in 1915 when we first came across the Maski edict, which names Ashoka. Maski is in the Dingsur Taluk of Raichur district in Karnataka. So it was for the first time in 1915 when C. Bedon came across this inscription, which is on your screen. And after looking at this inscription, in the first line itself, we had the name Ashoka. So all the inscriptions were connected to Ashoka. All of you know this. And the others are also in Karnataka, which name, uh, which have the name of Ashoka. One is in Mitur in Karnataka. Uh, 
and the twin site for nitur is kodegala here also we have the name of ashoka and rest of the edicts which are more than 180 have the name priyadarsh so definitely this is a very big clue that we had lost this name from the memory later on even when rudradaman issues his inscription in 150 uh, like second century ce by then the whole memory of priyadarshi was lost only what was remembered was asho so this is the time when the buddha savadana literature was in uh, was circulating and they had made the buddhist ruler ashoka so popular that priyadarshi had gone out of the like memories of the people and the fourth place where we get the name ashok is in madhya pradesh so it is very interesting that all the three names uh, or three edicts where we get the name of ashok are in karnataka only one edict is in madhya pradesh and karnataka is something very interesting you know because he we here we have at least 50% of the edicts which are the minor rock edicts of ashok now coming to this uh, site of nitur something uh, for the beginners you know i would like to mention that the minor rock edicts are the first edicts of ashoka to be issued and here in the minor rock edicts it is only for the southern territory that ashoka mentions that the second ashoka and gets his second minor rock edict in mind so the second minor rock edict is not for northern india so in the first minor rock edict which is uh, which is found from nitur here he talks about the whole world you know savapathavaya that is prithvi the whole of the prithvi so the context of this prithvi is interesting which we even find during the time of the guptas where the gupta rulers mention krishna prithvi jayarthena so this whole empire as a prithvi is a context which is also found in arthashastra but when we look at arthashastra it is from himavat to the sea so this context is not there in the ashoka inscriptions it is kind of a chakravarti kshetra of course but not from himavat to the sea it is almost the empire that is it is equal to the geographical connotation of jambu dwipa which he was alluding to when he was talking about the whole prithvi so what is the context of this prithvi he says that get all my minor rock edicts engraved throughout the empire throughout the prithvi you know the whole of my empire so uh, one of the regions with which i would like to begin today is the northwestern region that is taxila though i will briefly mention this region i will not elaborate on it but this region of taxila was very very important though here in the northwestern segment we also have kandahar which is again one of the most important sites but still when we look at the minor uh, at the major rock edict map we see that shabazgadi and manchera are very close to taxila so here this is the center where we are getting the two major rock edicts so what comes to our mind is probably the geographical conditions the environmental conditions in kandahar were not that congenial so they had the center here somewhere around taxila so from here they were actually controlling it and the northwestern region stands out because we all know about how chandragupta maurya had taken it uh, in lieu of 500 elephants from the greek successors you know of silicus but what again is very interesting is that there were so many non monarchical powers who were already present about whom we know from the text of anani and others so these powers these non monarchical powers were already present in this region uh, and like the malavas the oxidrapoids so on and so forth but you know there is a total absence of these powers in the ashoka inscriptions but again in the post mauryan phase we get these powers who are having their own small uh, territories but in the ashokan inscriptions we only get the site of the yonas and the kambojas so i'll come to this towards the end of my talk but just uh, mentioning this i would move on to the southeastern territory of kalinga so from the northwest now i am moving to the southeastern territory of kalinga and we have two major centers one is dhauli 
in Odisha and the other is Jogad. So the name, ancient name of Dhauli was Tosali and the ancient name of Jogad was Samarpa. And we all know, I'm not going to repeat this, how he had defeated and conquered Kalinga uh, after he has uh, like passed 30, uh, in his 13th regnal year, you know. But uh, the victory over the Kalinga region raises a few questions which I would like to raise today. See, this annexation of Kalinga to the Mauryan realm resulted in the maximum expansion of the empire because after this, he gave up war. So to, this was the last victory. But the question which comes to our mind is, if Kalinga was the last territory which was added, then what about the southern territory? Because Ashoka himself mentions that this was the Avijita territory. So this was a fresh conquest. And this territory was not within the uh, realm of the Mauryas. So, of course, we know that the Nandas had already, their, uh, con un under their control, they already had Kalinga because the Hathigumpa inscription of Karavela mentions this. Now, this Kalinga, it, if it was not within the Mauryan Empire and Ashoka was the first to conquer it, then how they were controlling the southern territory of uh, Suvarnagiri? And this was already a this was already under the Mauryans. We know this thing. Now uh, to this, I'll come a little later once again, but just raise this question, and uh, we, I'll come back to the territory uh, to the uh, site of Dhali, where you get this elephant. Now, when you go to Dhali, you will get to see this elephant. But this is a site. Uh, this is a picture uh, which. Uh, is courtesy the British Library. And this is how the site of Dhauli looked like initially, though this yellow color is something which I have added the highlight, because you know how the surface was prepared to engrave the inscriptions is something very interesting. So they had prepared this surface initially, the yellow surface initially, to engrave the inscriptions. So rocket uh, here we know that at Dhauli, we have rocket it one, to Rocketic 10, and after that, 11, 12, and 13 have been omitted, purposefully omitted. And we all know the reasons for omitting them because he did not want to remind the people of Kalinga about the Kalinga War. And then again comes Rocketic 14. Then just below this, we have a separate edict 2, and here again, fresh surface was prepared to uh, engrave. A separate rocketic one. So I am not going into the detail of the engraving pattern, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But you know, like when we look at Jogar, it is the same pattern of engraving. And uh, something very interesting at Jogar is that when they were engraving these edicts, they had chosen the right corner for engraving. So when they, this is the place where they had engraved all the edicts, that is rocket edict 1 to 14, omitting 11, 12, and 13. But here, this space, this is the second space B, when they had chosen this for engraving the edicts, they had put these edicts at the right corner, which reflects that the people who had engraved had the habit of writing from right to left and not from left to right. So there are several other reasons which have uh, allowed us to conclude, you know, that there was a set of people who had come down all the way from Northwest to engrave edicts. I'm not going into the detail of this, but please keep this in mind, because this will help us to understand another context later on. So this is the site of Jogar at the moment, and this is how it was engraved. First, this was engraved and this was engraved later. And this surface was kept for future communications. If at all uh, the empire would send them something, then they will engrave them here. So uh, this is the uh, space management at Job. Now coming to the Southern Territory, I'll gradually move from Dhali Jagar, that is the Southeastern Territory to the Southern Territory of Suvarnagiri. And from Suvarnagiri, there is another territory called Isila, which is different from Suvarnagiri altogether. So when you look at this, all the red points which are there on the map are minor rocketics, whereas this one and this one in blue, that Sanati and Eraguri are the major rocketics. As I had told that he had created the major rocketics at the entrance of the empire or at the boundaries of this empire. So when you are entering from the far south, then this will be the first. Uh, like you will come across the major rocketics. 
So at the boundaries of his empire where the major rocket is, one at Sanati and the other at Eragori. So this is something which is very, very interesting. Nine sites in Karnataka and three sites in Andhra Pradesh. So in those days, there was no Karnataka, no Andhra Pradesh. But of course, we can feel this, that how sites were chosen, you know. So the major rocketic site, as I mentioned, are uh, Sanati and Eragori. But the minor rocketics are random you know, randomly distributed. We have two minor rocketics. One is the rocketic one and the other is minor rocketic two. The context of the minor rocketic one is just that uh, two and a half years has passed they, that he has converted into a Buddhist. Though he had not done much, he was not very zealous. Uh, but now in the Jambu paper, the rulers are now mingling with the men because he's talking about devas who are the rulers who are now mingling with the men. Has now taken a zealous effort to uh, just uh, propagate Buddhism. You know, this is uh, there are three kinds of edict. One is a long, lengthy one. One is a medium version, and the other is a, a very small, uh, sankhipta version. So, three different versions of the minor rocketics are found. Now, talking about minor rocketic two, which is only and only found in South India, which gives us the character of the region. You know, it is like it's an agenda basically. So, minor rocketic two is of two types. Initially, minor rocketic one was engraved. In another boulder, minor two was engraved. At times, we find both of them together, so merged into one. So of course, these will be later on. So here we see that he mentions that how these are to be executed, how the transmission is to be done, the administrative hierarchy. And also, you know, we there is no Buddhist overtone in the minor rocketic too. But we get four categories of people. One are the brahmanas, then the elephant riders, the clerks and scribes, the riders of chariots or the two wheelers kind of. And so here, what is very interesting is that these are the people who are disseminating the edicts. You know? So uh, they would have been in charge of record keeping as well. So he was trying to create a set of local officers or administ for administrative purposes in the Southern Territory. So Southern Territory is a place where uh, he introduced a new language that is Prakrit. At the same time, he is introducing a new script that is Brahman. So the Brahmanas and the Acharyas who are actually coming from North India are trying to understand the societies and trying to create apprentices. So he's calling the Antevasas, you know, who are the pupil who are going to learn. So what he stresses upon is that you have to know the ancient usages and customs. So that is Purana Pakiti. So how you have to learn by a kind of an interaction and out of these people only, he would have selected a few who would have been the orators and narrators of the edict at each site because Ashoka had an orator at every site to read the edicts. So here, of course, one of the local persons who became well-versed in Prakrit due to the Brahmanas who taught them this language as well as the script, they would have like actually mastered this art and this talks about a two-way interaction you know it is not a one-way transmission just coming from the empire and yeah so the from the empire perspective when we are looking at this two major uh, rocketic sites one is that of Sanati and the other is uh, that of uh, Eraguri uh, so what we find is that Sanati stands out, you know, because this is the only edict in the whole subcontinent, which is on a free standing stone and engraved on either sides, on both sides. So none of the Ashokan inscriptions Sanat. are engraved. Yes, is there any problem? Am I audible? Uh, yes, yes ma'am, you're, you're audible. Uh, Ar Arjit. Oh, yes. Yeah. Thank you. So when you look at Sanati, then you find it's a freestanding stone. Here it's there on your uh, screen. And it was found on the Chandra, in the Chandralamba temple. And this deity uh, was actually sitting on it. And the roof of the temple collapsed. And the deity's hand got broken. And when it was taken out to, re to be replaced by another goddess, this is one of the Saptamatrikas which preceded the deity. 
this is the one, this is the DT uh, on your right. The hinge of this, uh, D, this uh, icon, actually, the sculpture was placed in the Ashokan inscription like uh, this, you can see here. And the DT was sitting on the Ashokan inscription. So it was a chance discovery. And finally, we find that uh, there are three generations of DTs, you know, the Saptamatrika first, and then this Kalika, and finally this modern DT here. And uh, the inscription is right now kept in Kadagana Halli, in the uh, site of Kadagana Halli. But what I would like to stress upon is that you have inscription on this surface as well as on this surface, both the either surfaces. On one side, you have Rokadik 12, and 14. So this gives us the clue, which just are immediately one after the other. This gives us the clue that Rokitic 13 is missing from Sanat. So the question which arises here is Rokitic 13 is the edict which talks about the Kalinga war and the remorse of Ashoka. So you can understand that by skipping this at Sanati, the ruler was trying to communicate something, you know, because the omission of this edict itself, the silence talks a lot, you know, it is quite vocal, the silence that the omission, which is a silence, it's very vocal because there should be some reason why he omitted it at Sanati, because Sanati is not a part of Kalinga. So definitely we know from the Kali, from the other edicts, where Drakitic 13th is found, other versions, that here he talks about the remorse, which uh, was due to the Kalingan war and how uh, thousands and lakhs and lakhs of people had died and some were deported. So probably the people who were deported from Kalinga were placed in this region of the Southern territory. When we are looking from this perspective, then we find that this is a region which had a lot of mines and mineral resources. So you need a lot of uh, manpower to work in the mines as well as uh, not only the uh, gold mines, but also the iron mines. So probably the Kalingans, a major uh, chunk of the uh, Kalingans were deported to this place. And uh, that is the reason why we, he would have avoided or omitted the 13th rocketic purposefully, whereas he is adding the 12th rocketic here, which is missing in the um, Dhali and Jogar versions. So on the other surface, you get separate rocketic two first and then sep separate rocketic one in grave below. And here this hole is the place where the DT was actually, the hinge of the DT was there. Now going to the other major site, which is Eragudi in Andhra Pradesh, we find that this is a place which had the major rocketics as well as the minor rocketics. So the minor rocketics were the first to be engraved. So what is the twin of Eragudi? It is definitely not Suvarnagiri, or it is definitely not uh, the Sanat site of Sanati because at Sanati we do not have minor rocketics. So Eragudi, as I mentioned, that every site has a twin. So the twin for Eragudi, interestingly, is Rajulamandagiri. So here, just to show you the Eragudi edicts, they are beautifully engraved. And the red one, which you see on your screen, is the minor rocket edict one and two combined here. And here, rest of the places, you have the uh, major rocket edicts distributed. So this is a site where you get both major and minor rocket edicts. So the twin side, as I mentioned, for Eragudi is Rajula Mandagiri. But the something very interesting about the minor rock edict here, it's, it, since it is a combined version, this is not one of the earliest, definitely, because the combined version comes later. Initially, you have minor rock edict in one, uh, one of the boulders and minor rock edict two in the other boulder. So when you have them as combined, definitely these are the later ones. So th there is a great error in engraving this edict. You will come to see. See, on your screen, you have the Eragudi edict, which I have highlighted. The yellow lines are written from left to right, whereas the blue lines are written from right to left. Again, the yellow line is uh, left to right and uh, right to left. The uh, red ones are the insertions, which the uh, uh, like engravers had forgotten, and later on, they inserted it. 
so what comes out from a deeper analysis which i call work pattern analysis is that this script is not boostrophedin because if it would have been boostrophedin it would have been continuously from right to left left to right right to left and left to right but here you find that this is an error of the uh, engravers because the engravers had come down from northwest and they knew that writing is always from right to left so when they completed the first line after that uh, in the supervision of the uh, supervisor somehow the supervisor had gone to the other side maybe probably the twin side and then they, they could not decide where to write from so they started from right to left and uh, there is a whole paper on this you can read it i'm not going into the detail of this but this gives us a kind of a regional perspective you know how people were traveling all the way the scribes and engravers were traveling all the way from the northwestern territory down to the southern territory in those days when communication and traveling was not so easy now when we move to the twin site of eragodi where the minor rocketics is found this is rajulamantikiri this was not selected for the major rocketic here you only have the minor rocketic in green so just to give you a quick glimpse of the minor rocketic twin sites this is gavimat and uh, gavimat is in kobbal district the twin site for gavimat is this is the inscription of gavimat the twin for gavimat is palkikundu in the kobbal district itself it looks like a palanquin so it's called palkikundu so just to give you this a uh, glimpse of the twin sun now from here i would like to move to a complex which is isila complex this is separate from suvarnagiri the name suvarnagiri itself gives us the clue that it is the mountain of gold so you know like this is the area where gold is found so the isila territory in suvarnagiri ashoka had placed his heir apparent that is aryaputra so the aryaputra was sitting in uh suvarnagiri but when you look at the uh, southern territory when you look at this uh, region itself you know you find that not the material culture had not developed compared to the other regions though this was under the mauryan control for such a long time but you do not find much development here so it was only the policy of extraction from this region but in return nothing much was being done only though he talks about purana prakriti exchange of knowledge and how to do things and uh, social exchanges but still when we look at the material culture we can definitely see that there is no development or very little development in this region now isila as i mentioned is the end of the territory it's the anta so ashoka is one of the rulers who is very conscious about his border and borderers and even the neighbors so here we find that the aryaputra is writing a new inscription and he is asking for uh, like some kind of advice from the empire to tell him how to execute it and this is being done by one of the scribes who writes a, a whole note Uh, that how to do this so initially he writes that a message that go to the isila territory meet the mahamatras greet them ask them good health and then tell them that devanang priya priyadasi has sent this message which is to be engraved now then follows the message so this means that the initial message which was a verbal message and not to be engraved on the rock surface got engraved by mistake and not only this it has a at the end portion it is authenticated by the scribe who signs of saying that it is being written by the lipikara now the lipikara is the scribe and not the engraver so the scribe who drafts the whole uh, inscription so he has to authenticate it until and unless he does that the inscriptions will not be engraved now what is very interesting here is that he signs off in kharoshti all of us know this and i will be showing you this there are three sites in the isila complex the first is the site of jatinga rameshwar here on your screen here you can see the scribe the scribe had signed in uh, kharoshti which has been engraved by the engraver uh, can you please mute your microphone thank you 
there's a feedback coming actually. So at the end, the authentication is both in Brahmi and in Karishti, which gives us the clue that the scribe was also from Northwestern territory. Excuse me. Now, in the Isila complex, other than Japping the Rameshwar, we also have the site of Brahmagiri in the Chitradur district itself. And here also you have the same uh, thing that is the name of the scribe, Chapada. His name is Chapada. And the third site is Siddhapur. So here, instead of having twin, you have a triplet. Now, here, this Chap Ashoka never allows anybody to write the name other than uh, Karuvakis and Tivaras, whose name he had engraved himself. He had given this permission to. But other than that, you do not find the name of any administrative officer, any Mahamatra, or even his chief queen engraved on, uh, on any of the inscriptions. So uh, you have seen how, by mistake, the name of Chapada had actually stayed in this. And a whole group of engravers and scribes had come all the way from Northwest. It is also proved by the, uh, uh, in the site of Chunar, where you get a lot of Karushti letters, which the uh, engravers or which the um, stone cutters had engraved. Now, when you're looking at the empire from the Southern territory, at, as I had mentioned that the governor in charge was the Aryaputra, and you have a lot of gold mines here, the iron mines and other minerals for which the empire was actually interested in this. Not, material, not much material development had taken place, as I mentioned. And uh, no, there is another very important point that Ashoka had arranged a whole uh, setup where the Mahamatras from Taxila and Ujjaini, that is the northwestern region, and the central region, that is Ujjaini, will travel every five years. They have to take a tour every five years. And this is a tour of inspection. And Interestingly, no, no Mahamatra from the Southern Territory actually travels, you know. So this arrangement is not done with the Southern Territory, but the Mahamatras of the uh, Kalinga region, that is the Southeastern Territory, are supposed to travel every three years, which is again very interesting. The Mahamatras of Ujjain and Taksira will travel every five years, but the Mahamatras of uh, Kalinga region will travel every three years. So probably this also gives us a context of the regional control. You know? And uh, I will come to this later if there is a question or uh, if anybody has any query. But for the time being, I'm saving some time for uh, Mahasthan. And uh, the question which comes, as I have already told, that why Rocketic 13 was omitted, omitted here. So the region, how was it accessed? Either you have to come all the way from the Malab, Malva corridor uh, via the Bhoja territory, the uh, Ratikas and Bhojas who are mentioned by Ashoka. Uh, either from that territory, you have to come down using the Malva corridor or else you can use the Chhattisgarh corridor. Something very interesting is that in the Chhattisgarh corridor, we get inscriptions which are contemporary to the time of Ashoka. And here you have the Sita Venga and the Jogimara inscriptions and which talk about resting station made out here. And uh, all of you are aware of the Jogimara inscription where we get the context that this rock cut bed which, was, uh, which is present here in one of the caves here in Sita Venga was made for the Devadasis to take rest, to lie down, you know. So this, he talks about a Lena Shaya being uh, created, and this has been created by Lupadakha, who is the Rupadaksha, that is the architect. Now, I'm not going into the detail of this, but Sita Venga inscription is definitely a resting place, which is officially made by one of the persons who had come down from Magadha, because this is in pure Magadhi, which is again, uh, an indication that they had, the person who had made this had come from uh, Magadha. Now, this brings us to a larger question that we have seen the Northwest, we have seen the Southeastern region, we have seen the Central region of Pujjani, we have seen the Southern region. Of course, Girnar and Sopara are the Western outposts. But what about the Eastern outposts? Why don't we have an Eastern outpost? Those because Bengal was totally different geographically and character-wise as well from the southeastern territory of uh, Kalinga. 
So what about Bengal? Why don't we find any major rock addict in Bengal? Because if this was a scheme of having the major rock addict in twins at every region, we should find two addicts in Bengal as well. So maybe one of the reasons may be that Bengal inscriptions would have been like Sanatin Freed Standing Stone, which we have lost, or else there was too much of autonomy and it was not required here. But in either cases, we have to explain what was happening in the territory of Bengal. Was it really under the Ashokan Empire? Or whenever you uh, read on the Ashokan Empire, on the Mauryas, uh, we almost see that Bengal is almost absent. Other than the uh, Mahasan inscription, there is just a passing reference to Bengal or what was happening exactly in Bengal. So, as I mentioned, that uh, we have to go into hybrid mode. So now I will be exploring the Mahasthan inscription. I'll be interrogating the numismatic evidence as well to understand. So as I had talked about this whole setup, we should find two inscriptions here in the Eastern Territory as well. Now, when we look at the Mahasthan fragmentary stone inscription, we know that this is one of the earliest inscriptions from Bengal. And uh, this is third century BCE. And this is found from Bogra district of uh, Mahas uh, Bogra district of Bangladesh in the site of Mahasthan. And uh, something about very interesting about the site of Mahasthan is that it was a site which was built overnight, as we can say. It, within a few years, it was built in the fourth century BCE. Suddenly, because we do not get any archaeological context to the site prior to fourth century BCE, it was uh, just on the bank of the river Karataya and in the barren tract. And when you look at this re whole region of undivided Bengal, then you, uh, you also have the site of Wari Bateshwar here. And of course, we have Mahasthan here. And uh, the twin for Mahasthan will be Bangar. And uh, I will just uh, go quickly to the Mahasthan inscription. Uh, this is the inscription which most of you would have seen on the internet, which is available. But I was surprised to see that it's a very, very tiny inscription. An Indian museum had displayed it in the centenary year. And it's a very tiny inscription. You can just see it here on your screen. And the color of the inscription is also different. And you might really think that why am I talking about the color? Because the author of this uh, inscription, like there are several authors who have actually historians and epigraphists who have interpreted and read this inscription. And this is one of the uh, like uh, most controversial inscriptions in the uh, like history of epigraphy. And uh, Bhandarkar, who had actually uh, read it for the first time, mentioned that it's on hard limestone. So, but the question arises, is it hard limestone or is it sandstone? Who had actually verified that it's a hard limestone? There was no geologist to confirm that this was a limestone. What difference will it make even if we come to know that it's not limestone and it is sandstone? What is the origin or the source of the stone is more important to us because where was this record uh, actually engraved? Was it sent from the center, from the empire, uh, metropolitan of the empire, or was it engraved here in Bengal is something which is very interesting, you know. The language is definitely Magadhi, which is interesting. And uh, uh, this, uh, these images which you can see here are Kalsi Indian Museum. And uh, see, the end of the uh, inscription shows us, the stone shows us that it is fragmentary and uh, the backside of the inscription is beautifully polished and you can see here that even the sides were initially polished. So with the help of the technique, how we uh, reconstruct the pottery shapes from pot shirts in the same way I tried the reconstruction of the size of this image and uh, probably it would look something like this this is imaginary portion and you will understand why I, I have imagined this portion with a few uh, images here I will come to that a little later but this is what is available at the moment so you should not get confused with this. And uh, here, uh, this was discovered by Bari Fakir in uh, November uh, 1931, when already the excavations had ended. You know, this was not found in the excavated context. This was just found by a 
It was a chance discovery. And it was acquired by Mr. G.C. Chandra, who was superintending archaeological, superintendent, archaeological survey of India. And he uh, acquired it from Bari Fakir for the department, and he sent it to the Calcutta office. And then finally, the decision was taken that it will be sent to the Indian Museum. Three stampages were prepared for this inscription, and uh, Bhandarkar used only one of them, thanks to uh, Archaeological Survey of India, Dr. Muni Ratnam, that I could get it. And as I mentioned, that this is one of the most controversial inscriptions in the history of epigraphy because there are so many translations available, and uh, most of them vary so much, you know. Uh, Bhandarkar, uh, who had actually interpreted the inscription for the first time, read that it, uh, it is to Galadana, one of the persons of the Sammangiyas. He was granted by order. The Mahamatra from the highly auspicious Kundranagar will cause to carry this, that is, will cause to carry Padi, granted to the Sammangiyas. And there is an outbreak of distress, you know, due to some superhuman agency, which shall be tidied over. When there is an excess of plenty, this granary and treasury will be replenished by Paddy and Gandaka coins. This is what Bhandarkar mentioned. So uh, I've just read this one. I will not be reading the rest of them. But this gives us the clue that there is a kind of a calamity or a distress in this region of Bengal. And the people, uh, or the Samvargiyas are being, the Samvangiyas are being helped, you know. So, uh, there is an allusion to a loan, according to all the scholars. So the second uh, interpretation came from Barua, who takes uh, the Sambhangi as a Chadvarvikas, that is a Buddhist community. And he thinks, uh, he relates uh, three places, you know, from where uh, the things are to be conveyed, the goods are to be conveyed. He talks about Suma, Sulakshmi, and Kundranagar. So he is imagining two places, Suma and Sulakshmi. And he, he is imagining this because just before this inscription, he had edited the Sogoda uh, bronze plaque inscription, where there was an allusion to three places, Mathura, Chanchu, and Medama. So he just thought this is also a similar context. This also talks about an, a calamity, a, uh, a kind of an emergency situation that is Atyaika. Atyaika or Atyaika mentioned in this. And he talks about uh, an Atyaika emergency due to water, emergency due to fire, and due to parrots, which is contradictory. If an emergency is due to water that is flood, how can there be fire and also the parrots coming? Because the grains will be destroyed and the parrots will not come. So where was this actually coming from? There are more interpretations by uh, scholars like Bonga Levi who talk about sesame seeds and firewood, et cetera, et cetera. And even uh, Mukherjee and Maiti talk about a person named Galardana now becomes Govardhana. So I'm not going into the detail of all these right now. But very quickly, I'll tell you that all scholars are of the opinion that the first line of the inscription is not the very first line, it's broken. So there was at least one line before. This is something which everyone agrees universally. So it begins with nena or anena. That means why did this token, by this token, that is this uh, uh, small stone plaque has been called a token plaque. And the Samvangiyas, that is the, the people of the Samvangiyas, then it talks about Taladinasa and Dumadina, which is very interesting. Taladina has been uh, taken as Taylor, you know, Taylor, Taylor. So they imagine sesame seeds or oil, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But Taladina is the name of a person. And then again, there is a name of another person named Dumadinasa. So the Samvangyas have a person named Taladina because there is a full stop in the record here and then starts the number Dumadina which is the name of a person who is a Mate so it will be a Mahamate then again a full stop the context ends now the context is Sulakite Puda Nagalate that is uh, Kundranagara which is Surakshita because this is in Magadhi Ra becomes La so this is Surakshita Kundranagara Kundranagara which is safe or Kundranagara which is in good condition so the flood is not in Kundranagara as we thought so Etang Nivahi Paisati means please take it whatever is being given you have to carry it yourself from Kundranagara which is safe so now who have to carry it after the full stop comes Sammangiyanam Sashane, which is very interesting. You know, this inscription has marks, viram, that is uh, end of the 
context is marked by a full stop which is uh, which gives us the context of the inscription most of the scholars had taken this these uh, full stops as futile you know useless but this full stops actually give us the context of the inscription now the samvangya is, is a sashana and what is given by, by this sashana dhaniyam that is they are being given unhusked paddy now after giving this they are taking take it given take it now there comes the again a full stop and why it is being given dagatiya ike that is due to water the atyayika or the emergency which has arose is due to water and then uh, comes the context that is pidaikasi that is the people who are suffering for them it is being given and the most important word is su atyayika that is su means good and atyayika but no emergency can be good i will come to this a little later then what is being given gandakehi copper coins so in the emergency situation no silver coins or karshapanas are being given what is given are the copper coins that is cast copper coins which are locally made and also dhani kehi that is anhas paddy which is to be taken from from this kotha gale is a kotha gale from this koshtaga from this granary please carry the dhana that is this granary is at pundranagara surakshita pundranagara and the flood is in the samvangya territory somewhere else so then follows the word posang and then the inscription is broken now you have seen the inscription i read quickly read my interpretation now of the text why this token Mahamatra Dumadina, stationed at safe Surakshita Pundranagar, is notified that Taladina of the Samvangya community or locality uh, has to make arrangements for paddy or anhas right, which is granted by this order, to be carried or taken at their own cost, which means not to be sent by the authorities at their cost from Pundranagar. So uh, this is understood. And then after full stop, it is taken. Nivahisati, take it from the specified store. Then, as there is an emergency at the Aika situation due to water that is flood, unhusked rice for sowing. In addition, is for sowing is my imagination. And in addition to this, those who are facing severe or extreme emergency for them, financial aid of copper coins from the treasury is being given. So, how do I imagine that there? This is not a loan document. Because there is no word for loan, Bhandarkar, Barua, and Sarkar had imagined a word called Bharaniye, and they had put it in brackets, mentioning that this is their construct. So Bharaniye is for replenishment or Paripurnai, as thought by, as uh, translated by uh, Sarkar. But this gave them the context of loan replenishment. But there is no loan uh, context in this inscription and no replenishment. In So, as we, I had told that gandakas are copper coins, how do I explain this? This can be explained with the help of a very later inscription. Of course, we know that gandakas. Even Professor B. N. Mukherjee had explained that gandakas are copper coins, and there are many more scholars who have talked about gandakas as copper coins. But the Faridpur grant of Dharma Aditya, which is a sixth century uh, C. E. Uh, record, it mentions dinaras, rupakas, and gandakas as dinaras are gold coin, rupakas are silver coins. Of course, gandakas will be copper. So uh, this. Whole uh, system of uh, mentioning actually gives us a supportive, corroborative evidence that definitely the gandakas were copper coins, and it continued. The practice of calling the copper coins gandakas continued up to the sixth century CE, if not later. Now, the question which arises here is. who are the samvangyas we have talked about the samvangyas so many times and i interpreted as the the flood was in the samvangya territory and not in the uh, territory of pundranagar pundranagar is north bengal and samvangyas something very interesting is it should be interpreted in the same way as we interpret samavadji as bhandarkar says samavadji means the uh, confederacy of the vridjis in the same way samvanga will be the confederacy of the vangas or the conglomeration of the people who are vangas so it is an allusion to the people and not to the uh, people and their territory you know there are many vangas small uh, territories which constitute the samavanga 
so where was this territory of vanga and if it is so why is it found in pundranagar then why is the inscription if the grant was given to the samvangiyas then why is the record found in pundranagar because because uh, it mentions uh, that this is pundranagar and it has to be taken from this koshtagar at pundranagar so uh, something very interesting is that vanga will be somewhere here and uh, we have got a very important site which is an excavated site of vari bateshwar and here we have uh, a fortification a uh, proper rampart moats and also it has yielded the maximum number of coins uh, from bengal and these are beautiful silver panchmark coins which are not mauryan panchmark coins but local coins uh, made uh, local coins which are used by the people of uh, this vanga territory you know these are not found from mahastan neither are these found from uh, the other territories like bangar it is only found from the site of vari bateshwar which shows that bengal in those days was not a single unit it was divided into several small regions and uh, just several small sub regions and you can see the cultural context very distinctly here on the coins you have lobsters you have fish and hook and uh, there are only four punches on the coins which shows that these are local panchmark coins and not mauryan panchmark coins so the region of banga had a different system of coinage for themselves so the numismatic evidence shows that this was a different autonomous space which existed in uh, parallelly in the mauryan territory and uh, why was this uh, aid given from pundranagar because the center uh, would have been pundranagar and as i mentioned that ashoka never allows the name of any mahamatra or any administrative officer to be mentioned but here i am mentioning that two mahamatras are mentioned here one is dumadina and the other is taladina why are their names mentioned the only reason is it involves transaction of money and also it involves the transfer of grains from one territory from the official granary of one territory to the other territory in an emergency that is atyayika where you need immediate help or urgent help so here we get the context of atyayika in the ashokan inscriptions rockadic 6 mentions this atyayika we also get the term atyayika in arthashastra where we have eight kinds of calamities uh, some are daiva and some are caused by other agencies but this brings us to the word so atyayika as i mentioned that i was perturbed by this term because so means good and atyayika means said uh, emergency situation and i was just uh, not happy with this expression that it will be a good emergency but then thanks to professor patrick oliver who actually drew my attention to the fact that so when it is added to a negative term like krodha or or to the words like tapas then it means intense or very extreme so su krodha will be very angry or extreme anger su tapas will be extreme asceticism in the same way su atyayika will be an extreme emergency so the whole inscription has a different context altogether where it mentions that there is a flood situation in the samavanga territory and the people of the samavanga territories are being given anhas party to uh, probably to so because if it would have been an immediate help from the center then it would have been rice anna and uh, here we find that this is a un probably anhas party for sowing so the center is actually bothered about its revenue and if they do not sow their seeds in time then the revenue from this territory will not reach the metropolitan and that's why the aid is provided wide an order from the uh, metropolitan to the mahamatra of kundranagar who is being ordered that please give uh, padi to the territory of samavanga and that's what this that's why this transfer is being made from kundranagar to uh, the territory of samvangiyas and there is no uh, such illusion that the people of samvanga will have to return it back because it mentions that if there is extreme emergency in that case you may also uh, probably apply to the koshadhyaksha and get a loan or a loan or get uh, money as help uh, from and this money mind it it's not 
silver coins, it is only copper coins, like petty amount from the treasury that is koshan, the word which comes is koshan. So definitely the kosha and the granary will not be at the same location. You know, the granary is in some other place and the kosha is at some other place. So the kosha definitely was located in the Sammanga territory and the granary was from where the aid came was in Pundranagar. So that is why twice it has been mentioned that this is being take, given, now come and take it. And then again, it is mentioned given. So these words, Nivahi Paisati and Nivahi Sati, actually give us the whole context of the inscription. Now, as you have seen that I had uh, actually reconstructed a few images, and the clue comes from the Sogoda bronze plaque, which also gives an illusion to an Atyaika, an emergency situation. Here you have two granaries and two tree-like objects, and of course you have a uh, the Mauryan official symbol, which is a three peak gel with a crescent. And this is a pillar or a post where taxes are being collected. And this was an order which, which has four holes. So it was actually to be nailed on the uh, door of the granary. And it is as tiny as the Mahasthan inscription, very, very small. And uh, anybody will actually not notice it, you know, ignore it while going or overlook it while going because it's extremely small and here we have allusion to two granaries and it talks about Dube Kothagale that is two granaries here. So our uh, inscription also has the reference to one granary in Kundranagar and the Kosha probably in the uh, territory of the Samvangyas. The question which arises here is why is the Sogoda inscription is in bronze and why is the Mahasthan inscription in stone? Because see if it is for emergency situation and it is coming from the metropolitan, the uh, probably the uh, material which was used would have been the same, that is bronze plug. And this is one of the earliest or the first inscription which is engraved on metal from the Indian subcontinent, the Sogora. But Mahasthan was in stone because Sogora was actually a portable inscription which was a notice and to be displayed on the um, uh, like door. But when you look at Mahasthan inscription, it is portable, it is a notification, but not for display. It was for the Mahamatra to show when the inspection actually would take place. He has to give the account. So it was for the purpose of accounting that why he has, uh, like how many bags he had given to the uh, Mahamatra of uh, Samvang years, why that amount of grain is missing, he has to give this kind of an explanation. And I would end today's talk with uh, this uh, uh, numismatic clue that when you are looking at Bengal, then uh, something very interesting comes up from Mahasthan itself, where we got the inscription. The points of Mahasthan and a nearby and a nearby site of Malgatsha, Marie Francois Buzak mentions in the report, uh, the French team which had worked, uh, Ja Francois Sal and the Bangladeshi team who had worked for the um, on the site of Mahasthan. In their report, Marie Francois Buzak and Alam they mentioned that uh, the Mahasthan coins are very less in weight, though they are Mauryan coins, but they are less in weight which is something which is uh, very disturbing, you know. They are Mauryan coins, which should have been Karshapana, 3.4 grains, but their weight varies from 2.1 to 2.7 grains, which is unique, in fact, which is, this is not found elsewhere. And so uh, the territory of Bengal was actually sending the amount for minting them locally to the metropolitan territory. So these metro, uh, Panchma coins were minted locally at Bengal, in the sites at Bengal, or in Mahasthan itself. And Mahasthan, that is Kundranagar, was actually sending the money to the metropolitan for minting these coins. And that's why that amount was deducted from the coins. And the coins are in lesser weight standard. This uh, amount, which was also given from other territories, this was adjusted by 
not reducing the weight of the coin, but adding of more alloy to the coin and reducing the silver. So this clue comes from uh, Arthashastra, where Kochilya mentions that coins can be minted elsewhere. That is Anyatra. The, the term which he uses is Anyatra. And if they are uh, issued elsewhere, then you have to give a certain amount, you know. As I had mentioned that the coins of Mahasthan uh, range from 2.1 to 2.5 grams and Baigacha are 1.7 to 2.9 grams. So the concentration level of the coins is very less, you know, it comes to 2.41 and uh, the original Karshapanas will be 3.4 grams. So here's something very, very interesting because silver is a higher valuation currency. And having the same currency minted in uh, a place which is very close to Magad in a lesser way definitely needed the uh, consent of the metropolitan or the consent of the emperor to do so. So this gives us the whole context of this region. So every region had its own uh, character, you know, as we think that the Mauryan Empire would not have been that centralized as we had imagined earlier. And already Professor Thapar had also talked about the uh, different, uh, like, uh, difference in the uh, region levels, you know. But here, uh, with evidences from different territories, what I'm trying to argue today is each region had its own character and uh, the balance was very different, you know, rather we can talk about a kind of an imbalance in the whole territory, in the whole empire. So uh, a few questions which I would like to raise are, was the Mahasthan this record issued from Magad or locally issued at Mahasthan? Uh, definitely, even if it was issued at Mahasthan, it was done by the Mahamatra himself, who was an official of uh, the Metropolitan, sent from the Metropolitan Territory, who was appointed here at Mahasthan, that is Kundranagar. And uh, Bengal had several small sub-regions, and each region would have his, its own Mahamatra. And if this was issued for Vanga Territory, why is it found at Varendra? I have already answered. This is found in Varendra because the grain was transferred from Kundranagar. This actually brings to my mind, you know, the Persepolis tablets. The Mahasthan inscription probably is the only inscription which we have in the subcontinent, which is almost similar to those tablets which are found from Persepolis uh, uh, in Ephemerid Empire, that uh, how accounting was being done and grains were removed from the granary and salaries were given to different people, though it's not just the same, but it is very similar to this, this kind, you know. So uh, this is the earliest phase of writing and the record is so organized that it is not possible that it will be done locally in the region that is at Kundranagar until and unless we believe that the Mahamatra did it, who was trained in doing so. But definitely I would like the Indian Museum authorities to examine the stone by a professional uh, geologist who can confirm where the stone comes from. So that will actually give us a clue. So uh, the assumption of the term Mahamatra doesn't make any difference because you know the word which we get in the inscription is Mate. So we cannot imagine that it was a Sumate, definitely it would have been a Mahamatra, but it does not make any difference. And uh, the macro region of Bengal was in close or the closest proximity to the metropolitan region of Magad. So the question which arises here is how, how and why did the uh, metropolitan area allow Bengal so much of autonomy? Because the whole geography of this region was very different. It, was, uh, it is a land of rivers, all of you know, and floods are very frequent out here. So it would not have been very easy to manage uh, this whole territory of Bengal, which was divided into several sub-regions from Magad. So they would have allowed a lot of autonomy to the uh, region of uh, regions and sub-regions of Bengal. Now, uh, the final thing which will come, which comes to my mind is, uh, uh, is it a kind of a periphery? Even if it's a periphery, it's very different from Suvarnagiri, you know, as we had seen. So the uh, whole thing, when we look from the regional perspective, what the highlight for today's talk was is actually the variation, the unevenness, the imbalances, which are very, very prominent. So uh, 
this gives us the clue that each region within the Mauryan Empire had, has to be dealt separately from different angles. And uh, Ashoka was probably the first ruler, as I mentioned earlier also, who was very conscious about his territory, his borders, his neighbors, and he had uh, made policies for each uh, of the regions separately. So uh, we find two opposite poles, you know, the monarchical forces and the non-monarchical forces or so non-monarchical forces will have a love for autonomy exactly. And uh, the, when we look at the regional context, uh, there is the considerable distance, you know, which we find here and the variegated territories, the different socioeconomic conditions, all would have led to the kind of making of a policy for each region separately. And we cannot treat the Mauryan Empire as a unitary empire. It's a subordinate power with regional imbalances. That is what will be my submission. And I would like to thank all the epigraphists who have burned their midnight oil for reading all the records and just uh, uh, I like a pygmy stand on their uh, shoulders, you know, to look at the empire right now. And thanks to Professor Patrick Oliver, Professor Randi Chakravarti for Prakrit. Uh, I would like to thank Jagatram Bhattacharya, Indian Museum, Sharon Bhattacharya, Satyakam Sen, uh, Rahul Singh Ji. Uh, for the graphic designing of the Mahasthan plaque for the reconstruction, I would like to thank Rajiv Chakravarti. For the stampages of the Mahasthan inscription, I would like to thank Muniratnam and uh, my research scholars, Chandrema and uh, Soumya. And uh, for the Hyderabad, Karnataka Region Development Board, who had allowed me to survey all the sites from Karnataka, Nepal, and Bihar. I would like to thank them and my own university, my alma mater, for allowing me to do this. And uh, of course, there are many more whom I would like to thank, but I would like to dedicate this talk in memory of Professor B.P. Sahu, who was a very good friend of mine, and of course, your colleague. And uh, with Professor B.P. Sahu and with uh, Professor Ranbir Chakravarti, I visited the site of Maski for the first time. And of course, we had an interpreter. So thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you, ma'am. We all are really grateful for your stimulating talk. Now the floor is open for the questions, question answer session. Uh, ma'am, we have questions from Facebook, but I'll first allow people from Zoom who are here in this meeting. Of course. Uh, please, please go ahead. No, I think that there are a whole lot of very pertinent questions by Dr. Shiva Aruni from Facebook. So why don't you begin with them? Okay, ma'am. Uh, ma'am, the first question is by Shiva Aruni. Uh, do you agree that Soranagiri referred in the Ashokan edicts was Sanati? This is the first. Ma'am, shall I? Uh, do it one by one or um, I should do it in you no know, once at once second comment is how I'll do take you well uh, professor Aruni's questions together can you just put all the questions by professor Aruni together Dr. Yeah, sure Aruni together. Um, how do you evaluate and comment on the research and statements of professor S. Sitter on the Ashokan edicts and contribution of Ashoka in to the southern language and script yes. knowledge why do we not find the urban context to the, to the Mauryan period in the Deccan particularly, particularly in the Karnataka, uh, in Karnataka, no urbanity features to the Ma Mauryan Ashokan period. Maski, yes. uh, Brahmagiri, Kupal do not have urban layers yeah. in the excavations. And the last comment is your interpretation of the Mahasthan inscription is convincing and very well. Uh, if we find a similar one, uh, it will be fantastic. I don't know if you find similar one, find. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's all from uh, Dr. Aruni. Yeah. So I would like to answer all the questions. These are all very pertinent. Thank you so much for these fantastic questions. Of course, yes. Uh, like personally, I would agree that Suvarnagiri is Sanati. You know, I will give the reasons why. Even Professor Sector believed that Suvarnagiri was Sanati, and you had uh, probably most of you have seen the uh, small uh, documentary film which we had made on the southern sides of uh, Ashoka. And if you have not seen, I would request all of you to go to YouTube and see it because you'll get to hear Professor Sector, who is no more with us, and what a fantastic scholar he was. And of course, Professor uh, Ranbir 
Chakravarti, Professor Shimali, and others, also you will be able to hear NDP Sahu as well. So, uh, Suvarnagiri, according to Professor Setter, was also the Sanati because you know you, you only have two major sites of major rocketic sites. One is Aragudi and the other is Sanati. And as I mentioned, that when compared to Eragori, you find that the Sanati edict stands separately. You know, it is a single edict which is found from the whole subcontinent, which is written on either side. So it was sent from somewhere to Sanati, and they were saving space because if you write in uh, on one side, then you have to send two stones. If you write on either sides, you save stones. So it was uh, like actually sent from a place to Sanati. And Eragodi was actually engraved here and there. And uh, Eragodi, as you have seen, uh, when you are looking at the minor rocketics, Eragodi has a minor rocketic which is full of errors. And this probably led uh, Ashoka to formulate this whole thing that uh, the Aparadha will be Lipikara's Aparadha. It has to be shouldered by the scribe, even if the fault is of the engravers, the officer in charge or the superintendent in charge of engraving has to take the responsibility of the errors. So the Eragori edict, which was engraved by mistake, probably led him to formulate this, probably, of course. But coming back to this point, you know, why is Suvarnagiri? Because it is closest to the mines, you know, because it is an allusion to gold mine, you know. So the Mahati mine is very located very close. And of course, for Professor Setter's view, I agree with all his views, you know, about the Southern edits. And only for the uh, single thing, which I do not agree, is about Chapada. That because Chapada, as my research shows, that uh, rather our research shows, because it's a team, that uh, Chapada's inscription was engraved by mistake. His name was engraved by mistake. If at all Ashoka would have come to know that a scribe is mentioning his name, he would have never allowed, you know, this to do with this thing. So uh, only for this part, I agree with the rest of the things. And uh, about the urban uh, context, you know, that is what I mentioned, that the southern territory does not have any material development. You do not find any development because... The policy was that of extraction, just having that territory under them. And that is the reason why Aryaputra was placed here. And not much was done to improve the condition of the territory, though Brahmanas were sent, Acharyas were sent, because you are imposing a script, you are imposing a language, you are imposing your customs to, a, to an alien territory. So uh, a group of people were sent, but definitely... Uh, no development was actually done from the center for the southern territory. So that is my submission. I hope I have answered all your questions. Any other question from other people? Like, Thank you, ma'am. Yes, ma'am, there are four more questions uh, yeah, from please. Samita Haldar via Facebook. Uh, is it possible yes. to issue edicts in Bengal by Ashok on Terracuta uh, plagues? Uh, those we have lost due to weathering, etc. I would also like to know the position of Northwestern area in modern territory, its role in administration. If you kindly elaborate, would be helpful. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much for this interesting question. Of course, yes, I believe that uh, following Monica Smith's work, you know, Monica Smith and team, the way they have worked on the Ashokan inscription, uh, how they have tried to show that what are the probable sites from where we can get inscriptions in future. Following that, I would like to add, you know, that we will get more inscriptions in future uh, if they have survived from Bengal, of course, because that is a territory which needs, you know, uh, two more edicts. The map shows that actually. So in that way, the policy which he had taken actually reflects that there should be no more edicts. But in the coastal territory, you cannot have boulders, you know, stone boulders you do not have. So you cannot engrave the rock edicts uh, the way you have done it in the other territories. In that case, there are two options. Terracotta plug is not a very good option, you know, for rocketics because they are huge. So the option would be a freestanding stone like Sanati and like Sopara. See why Sopara stone is also uh, like 
it's a fragmentary stone inscription used as an anchor later on. But see, in the same manner, the Sanatni edict was in a freestanding stone. Probably Bengal inscriptions were also freestanding stones. And I will wait for a chance discovery like the Sanatni edict uh, that someday Bengal will also yield similar uh, edicts. You know, I hope that they are not uh, destroyed. Because at Sanati they were vandalized, you know, all the edicts are, we have lost, all of them. Only what remains is this small stone which was protected by the deity. Uh, okay, ma'am, there is one uh, more question which is related to the earlier one. Uh, uh, do you believe that during the period of Mauryas, especially from Chandragupta to Ashok, Afghanistan was used as a buffer zone between the Seleucid and Mauryan Empire? Yes, of course, you know, because uh, definitely you need to have a buffer uh, space because when you look at uh, Ashoka's, uh, as I mentioned, you know, that Ashoka was very clear about his, uh, rather Priyadarshi was very clear about his borderers and his antas. And here also he was very clear about uh, having a buffer here. But this buffer would not have been very prominent one because, you know, the geographical barriers are already present. So you need, uh, you do not need a proper buffer in that case. As I mentioned that at Kandahar, uh, the environmental conditions were not that good. Even when you look at during the time of the Mughals also, Shah Jahan and uh, even later on the Mughals mentioned that it is very difficult to stay there and hold it, you know, the hold the territory. In the same way, even during the time of the Mauryas, it would have been very difficult to have a proper control over Kandahar, uh, at least sitting in Pataliputra, keeping a strong control over Kandahar and these regions would have been very difficult. It would definitely have been a buffer, uh, but it was a very open kind of a buffer zone. As this, the character of the region reflects that. It was on the crossroads. Uh, Ma'am, uh, very one, more question very quickly. Uh, there, there is a bunch of questions related to Bengal. Uh, is there any Ashokan edict to uh, find out present in the? Is there any uh, Ashokan edict in the present Bengal? And there is no, no, question. none, none. Okay, ma'am. Then and Arul wants to ask a question. Yes, sir. Ma'am, please it's... go ahead. Uh, please go ahead, ma'am. You want me to ask now? Uh, sure, or sure, do you want me to wait? Uh, Ma'am, no, no, please. I want okay. your comments now. Then I'll okay. uh, allow others. Well, okay. I have actually very minor, but I think um, yeah, Professor Sushmita Basu Majumdar did, a, did an excellent job of foregrounding the regional perspectives in the, in the Mauryan Empire through what is her absolute expertise in the epigraphy uh, of the period. I have very... Um, very minor observations, and I wanted her uh, thoughts on this. You know, let me uh, let me begin with the uh, Mahasthan um, uh, inscribed uh, plaque because that's the that's the one that we saw right in the end. Um, uh, Sushmita, if I may call you Sushmita, yeah, please. <laughs> okay, so Sushmita, um, one of the things that I was thinking about that since the word Sulakite. Yeah. in the Mahasthan inscription is so central to the identification of the territory of the, you know, where the emergency actually happened. Uh, would you consider Sulakhite to mean Sulikhite? Would that be possible or does it not go with yeah. the overall interpretation? Uh, the it will not go with the interpretation and none of the scholars have actually taken it in that way because mm -hmm. either they have taken it in the context of su lakshmite that is giving uh, auspicious you know pundranagar so yes, as an yes. adjective of pundranagar they have mentioned it su as lakshite. So, su lakshite also will not be very uh, like the same meaning you know auspicious mm -hmm. or showing good signs mm -hmm. but here, the whole inscription is in Magadhi. So, in Magadhi, Ra becomes La, like Raja becomes Laja. So, the probability is that of Surakshite and not safe Pundanagar, but mm. a well fortified Pundanagar. 
Mm-hmm. You know, because the Pundran, the Mahasthan has a very interesting porch and a rampart and wonderful uh, structure. So it is probably the fortification, the fortified structure of Mahasthan, which is actually highlighted here. The mm-hmm. Surakshita Pundranagar, well fortified okay. and well, okay. protect, well protected, uh, safe Pundranagar. Okay. So that uh, is why the granary is located here. And the public granary, mind it, it is the uh, emperor, like you can say the empire's granary. Okay. The official granary, which is located here. So that brings me to the granary, uh, Sushmita. Uh, yes. The, the Soha Gaura, uh, uh, you know, inscription with, plan, with, yeah. the, with, with, the, with the motifs on top. Now, for a long time, architectural historians... Mm-hmm. Have interpreted the two symbols of the uh, of what you call the two tiered granary structure yeah. as representations of two shrines of, yeah. of temple. Because the Sohagora uh, uh, inscription uh, with its motifs actually is used as one of the numismatic evidences for yeah. a two tiered structure. We have other evidences. So my question is that in the inscription you mentioned that the two granaries are specifically mentioned. If that is so, then that needs to be removed yeah, from the analysis Parul, of, uh, the evolution of early temple request, architecture. Parul, I would really request you to do that because, you know, the inscription is very clear. I'll send you the, uh, like my book is going to come next month probably. So you okay. can just have the whole inscription there. And okay. it actually talks about Ete Duve Kotha Galani. That is two Koshtha Galas. And additionally, it says Tri Gharbani. That is three tiered, not two tiered. And the uh, uh, photograph is also that the like, representation is also of a three tiered structure, not a two tiered. So it has three so, tiers. Yeah, yeah, okay. So, so but the interesting, ti, yeah. Okay, tighavani, go on, go on. yeah. Tighavani actually is the word which is tri hmm. garbhani, three tiered. And of course, this is definitely a granary, you know, definitely. Okay. All so, this Koshta Garas are also shaped like temples. So, as far as Champa in Vietnam, the Koshta Garas are shaped okay. in the same way as yes. the temple. So, there again, I mean, its usage may not be wrong in terms of form, but it needs to be corrected from a prasada vimana to a koshthagara. Definitely. Yeah? So Definitely. That, I mean, I, let me not eat up too much time, but I have two very quick questions and then others really need to speak. So the other thing that really excited me was the mortise hole on the Sannati uh, Rocky date, where then, you know, uh, with the tenant, the, the, the deity yeah. goddess is fitted. Now, yeah. that is completely unique. So it is. is it an afterthought? It's happening a couple of centuries later. Uh, is this is the, so is the rock is... edict slab being used later? That is something that needs to be uh, considered. Yeah. That it may uh, not be uh, part of the original. Adul, I have an answer, very quick answer for this, you know. Yeah, because yeah. see, there are three generations of goddess. The reason for showing that was this. That mm. initially it was a Saptamatrika. And later you, you have seen that it's a 7th, 8th century sculpture. Which is the mm. second sculpture on which this was sitting. The mm. uh, On the Ashokan inscription was placed as a Vedi, you can say. And yeah. they had cut this hole to put the tenon. So, uh, rather the hinge kind of a thing. But the thing is that... Till 7th, 8th century, the Ashokan inscription was available at Sanati. And that's why yes. they could reuse it, you know. And they had completely forgotten about the Buddhist context of the stone because yes. the Vedikas are supposed to be one of the most purest stones which have to be brought, you know. So it was a dressed stone which actually allowed them to use it as a... Agreed, agreed. But even the first one, uh, the I mean, so there is a, there is a history of reuse uh, yeah, of the is. of that inscribed uh, stone, yeah. Mauryan um, inscribed Mauryan stone. Uh, even the Saptamatrikas cannot be of the Mauryan period because we no, don't they are know not. That. So they are not. All later, three thrice reused. Yes, yes. Okay. You know, okay. in in yeah. my book, uh, the Mauryans in Karnataka have spoken about this. You know how they yeah. have been yeah. reused and several times reused. 
And then the final one, which is the omission of Rock Edict 13 in Sanity yeah. uh, and the omission of Rock Edict 13 for very obvious purposes in Kalinga. Now, uh, that, that same Rock Edict is omitted in Sanati. Uh, would you attribute it to orders from top down? Say orders given by Ashoka to deliberately omit it in Sanati? It yes. has nothing to do with the migration of artisans mm -hmm. or anything. You know, scholars were actually thinking that mm -hmm. the Sanati edict, the draft of the Sanati edict probably came from Kalinga because th that was a contagious area. So that's why Rocket 13 was omitted. But now when we know that Rocket 12 was included, we know that it did not come from Kalinga because mm -hmm. in the Kalinga region, 12 was also missing. Mm. So, you know, the orders came from definitely the central draft store and the work pattern analysis, which we have developed now, now, and you can see on Academy, I have all my papers. This shows how the central store was sending the drafts to the regions. So this is a kind of a communication process, which we have developed that uh, who even in uh, the most interesting thing is in very few words, I'll mention that the Mahamatra of Dhauli and Samapa uh, either went themselves or sent a person for individually to write the edicts, you know, both wrote it down separately. So the there were two scribes. We will, we will actually assume that if two sites are very close to each other, we will save the cost by sending one person to engrave two. But this is not so in the case of Nittu Rudegolam. It is not in the case of Eragudi and Rajul Mandagiri. Every site has a different uh, engraver, set of engraver and uh, set of uh, supervisor, you know, um, so scribe. So this shows that the control was very strong from the center while he was sending this edicts. So the project of engraving edicts itself is very interesting. You know? yeah. I'll write a project report on it one day. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much for everything. And I think let, let the others ask questions. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Uh, before I allow Ajit to go ahead, I have one uh, brief announcement to make that uh, uh, please stay tuned with us for the next talk. All our, I, uh, I'm making this announcement to all our viewers that uh, there is another lecture coming up next week. Please, uh, details will be shared through our department website. Please uh, visit our website, department website. Okay, Ajit, go ahead. Am I audible? Yes, you are. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. So, ma'am, firstly, thank you. It's really great to see you back. You know, and the, uh, I mean, it's uh, you were always uh, the way you spoke in the class. Just we felt that same, although we are miles apart from each other. But then, still, I, I would, you know, I convey know. the sentiment that I have, so to say. So what I wanted to, you know, ask was really uh, that how does, you know, Ashoka, uh, uh, I mean, in his whole construction of the, you know, concept of his, you know, empire building or Jambudit, so to say, I mean, how does he view that? I mean, is it uh, just as what Monica L. Smith would likely, you know, uh, I mean, uh, likely let us believe that it's uh, just a, uh, you know, it's a it's an empire where it's you know of a of a connection or a connecting node between different imperial nodes, like you were mentioning of uh, Suvarnagiri as one, or uh, in I mean uh, where the Mahasthan inscription sat as the second one. So how do you you know how do you look at this entire process of you know Ashoka you know trying to carve out its empire is it just i mean uh, i mean the fact that you were mentioning that the autonomous spaces had you know a very you know different uh, way of existence which was not in congregus with the you know metropole metropole so to say so how do you view this entire process man is it with line with monica smith work of loosely you know loosely administered terrain or is it something different? Thank you, Arijit, for this question, interesting question and your kind comments. Uh, that, uh, see, first of all, uh, I would partially agree with Monica's uh, idea of this because of course, yes, 
that is what i was just trying to show through the primary sources you know because very few people have taken the primary sources as evidence to show that how the degrees are varying in the regions so now we have both numismatic and epigraphic evidences coming joining hands to reflect how things vary from region to region even for taxila i have a lot of arguments you know but definitely this one hour is not enough to talk about every region but definitely it was a single empire a single structure for priyadarshi i would refrain from calling him ashoka though it was also his name but he would have preferred calling him priyadarshi so uh, priyadarshi is his name as he says priyadarshi naam raja in the pangurari ide so here you know uh, the empire was a whole uh, you can say a single unit which he had in mind and he he was very conscious about the hugeness the vastness of his empire because in rocket it 14 he himself says it's mahalake he vijita so it is huge and the like varied uh, like regions their differences all these he was aware of and that is the reason why we are finding these regional variations in the dialect regional variation in the uh, like writing of each uh, edict you know so uh, this was done to suit the needs of that region so even the omissions mind it the omissions are very important instructions to us who are epigraphists to understand silences and also the whispers of the inscriptions so that way you know the, it was a loose control over some territories it it is not a i cannot give a generalized statement that it was either a loose control or it was a very centralized but definitely it was not as centralized as an empire should be imagined but he had varied control over the region so it was loose control in bengal it it was more autonomous autonomy given to bengal in comparison to suvarnagiri territory or in comparison to the western territory where the control was much more strong so you know ujjain was much more stronger taxila was so it simply by calling them periphery will not solve our issue so it's not a metropolitan core periphery a simple formula is not going to work for the ashokan empire we have to rethink and that is why that's the only reason why i say that i'm trying to revisit the mauryas through this just raising the questions what is the degree of the control of the re of uh, the central control over each region that varies so it's it's separate for each region so it's not that simplistic so one has to look at it region by region so now we have the regions and uh, very soon uh, that's going to come up uh, i'll share with all of you thank you thank you ma'am we thank are really you, grateful uh ma'am uh, we are really grateful but there is a uh, we, we are running out of time we have a lot of questions but we feel really sorry because we don't have too much time now uh thank you ma'am and we are equally thankful to our seminar committee members who have taken up all their responsibilities uh thank you very much and now i think i should close it here ma'am i would like thank to thank you. each one of uh, you for uh, giving me this opportunity uh, especially professor razi uh, for this uh, opportunity which he has given and for all the communication to professor parul panyadar who is a very good friend professor seema baba and everyone else you know in the department who are my colleagues there so and all my dear students thank you so much for listening and uh, everyone who is listening in fy facebook and uh, youtube thanks to each one of you i'm sorry i couldn't answer please text me i'll definitely try to answer your uh, queries thank you so sure, much sure ma'am thank you thank you